Because it says in Genesis, let there be light. Thank you. So I hope you can trust the message that I have to deliver with you today. Because I obviously have an indecision problem. I got up this morning, couldn't figure out which shirt to wear, so I just grabbed some and threw them together and <laughs> sold myself one up here. So, so anyway, good morning all. It's January. Note for you to observe in God's nature a sign of spring, at least as best as I've been able to come up with, starting in about a week and into the first few weeks of February. If you see the skies, you'll see geese in flocks of three. And then you eventually, in a week or two, you'll see geese in flocks of two. They are starting to uh, attract mace and starting the whole birth process all over again as we enter into spring. So that's what I've observed is how you can tell spring is about to come is watch the geese. So, and they are starting to return as we can see in the fields as we drove up here this morning. So I'm going to take this opportunity to do like uh, all speakers we have come up here in front. And I'm going to spend some time talking about myself this morning. They say if you're uncomfortable about speaking in front of people, just talk about yourself because you know more about yourself than any other so subject that you can study. <laughs> so here we go. In late September, uh, we had four calves to, for, to butcher, uh, more than we've ever had before. So I didn't want to see four gut piles out in the field and all the magpies and the coyotes and all that. To, gather around those sorts of things. So I decided we'd take them to town, load them up, take them to town to have them uh, processed. So in that process, I had borrowed some gate panels from, the, from a neighbor and hauled them over, loaded them up, got the cows loaded and then took them back. And about four or five days later, I had this severe pain in my left side and the pain down my leg and all that. And so it was just really excruciating. So I went to a chiropractor and he didn't seem to help. And a friend of mine had a TENS machine, which is, I don't know, a shop sheet or some kind of thing. So I went to, I, he, you know, he said it really helped him. So I, Jeannie went to town and bought me one and I used it for the, as the instructions said, to use it no more than 30 minutes. So I could, couldn't hardly stand it, so I did it 15 and then waited a half hour and then did it 15 more. And in, in 12 hours later, my back pain was so bad, I went to the emergency room in the hospital. So they, you know, looked me over and said, well, you know, okay. So they gave me good, strong medicine and sent me home. So a week later, I wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I was so cold and shaking uncontrollably and Jeannie had no way of helping me, so I got myself an ambulance ride into the hospital. And from that experience, I can tell you, ambulances are really rough when they cross railroad tracks. <laughs> <laughs> Just about bounced me out of it, or out of there. So anyway, so they run tests, MRIs, and because they were, my total complaint was about my bad back. So they kept looking at that, MRI and some bunch of other tests and the, my, my white blood cell count was really high so they knew I had some kind of an infection. So they kept me in overnight. The next day everything, all the signs of my blood tests were improving so they sent me home. Uh, then a week later, again I wake up early in the morning and I'm cold. Oh by the way, when I got to the hospital I had a temperature of 104. So that got everybody excited. So then a week later, I wake up, and again, I'm very cold, shaking, but not as bad as this other time. So she calls my daughter, they come up and take me into the hospital. And this time, they run me through a CAT scan. And it wasn't 10 minutes after they did the CAT scan, they come out and says, well, you, you have a you gold battery going south on you. Uh, we'll send you to Missoula and have it operated on. So that was fine. So I got another ambulance ride in the, into Missoula. We had a, quite a talk with the doctor because we wanted to jump in the car and get down there. And he said, no, no, you're, you're 
you're going <laughs> to, in case something happens on the way in, why we want you in an ambulance. So, so we got an ambulance right in there. And when I got into Missoula, I had a temperature of 105. Mm -hmm. And so, needless to say, I wasn't feeling very well. Uh, but it really aggravated me. There I am laying in the bed and shivering so cold, and this nurse comes up and starts stripping blankets off of me. And I said, no, wait a minute, I'm cold. Don't take the blankets away from me, I'm, you know, freezing. And she says, we gotta get your temperature down. If I, I'm gonna take the blankets off and it doesn't work, I'm gonna put ice bags in your armpits. <laughs> <laughs> and that didn't, wasn't very encouraging. <laughs> so anyway, I got much better after they did cool me down. And then, I guess the humorous part of the process was they, uh, with our new Obamacare, why they have to ask you a series of stupid questions. <laughs> so the nurse comes in, and I don't know if she was sitting next to me on the bed, honey, was she? Or? No, she was a few feet away from me. What's that? She was a few feet away from me. OK, anyway, she asked me one of the questions she asked me if I was ever anxious. And I thought about that for a moment. I said, yes, yes, I've been anxious. And she sits there and waits like I'm going to answer her. <laughs> and so, she's, so then she says, well, can you tell me when, when you were anxious? And I says, yes, the first time I jumped out of an airplane, I was really anxious. <laughs> and you know, she looks at Jeannie like, is this guy for real? <laughs> so yeah, so that's, that was that question. Then the next one she asked was if I was uh, afraid to go home. And I says, yes, definitely I am. And she says, well, why? I says, because I have to drive in Highway 93. <laughs> <laughs> and then the third one that I thought was the stupidest of all of them. He says, how are you treated at home? And I thought about that, and I says, like a prince. Like a prince. So that was good. So anyway, they put me in front of three other surgeries because I was in such bad shape. And they uh, ran me into there. And when I was laying there, just before the surgery started, I, or before I went down, there was a nurse there. And I says, would you do me a favor? I said, yeah. And she says, yes. I said, is there anybody down there in the operating room that prays? And she says, well, I'm sure there's somebody of that persuasion. That's how she worded that. I don't know why. She says, do you want them to pray for you? And I said, no. I will. This is hard. I want them to pray for themselves that they will know what to do. Mm -hmm. And that was the answer to prayer, that they did do that. They got in there, I was so messed up in there. My gallstone was about the size of a meatball, they said. It had blocked off, blocked off the blood supply to my uh, gallbladder, so it was dead and had gangrene in it. And uh, I had a massive infection on my liver. So the other prayer request that I had that, that was so important, I guess, to me, is I've seen so many people with gallbladder surgery that they open them up from here to here. And I know from past experiences that recovering from that is a horrendous process. Uh, Pat, when she was here, I was, she could explain how that works. Uh, so anyway, they have this lipo, lipo process, whatever they sit, they can suck the gallbladder out of your out of your system so the surgeon said she would try to do that if not they would have to open me up so through the whole process I get through and yeah I have a little scar right there or one little one right there so they were able to use the life of this suction thing out and she did say that you know opening me up would not have uh, helped through the process so those are some of the answers to prayer that I had through that process. And uh, there was, you know, others that I won't go into at this point in time. But praise the Lord, thank you for your prayers. I'm still here. Uh, one time, looking back on it, when I was in, in the hospital in Hamilton, I was laying there and praying, that, Lord, just take me home. I'm ready to go home. And I said, if it will help, I'll cut a hole in the ceiling. <laughs> so that's what drugs do to you, I think. <laughs> yes, like I didn't, he couldn't come and get me unless I cut a hole in the seat. <laughs> yeah, right. 
Okay, what we're going to talk about this morning, as I got into the study of this thing and preparing to deliver your message today, I came to a really a quick realization that the topic I picked is about a 20 week uh, course. So we're going to do a little bit today and what I've, instead of studying the Holy Spirit, what I've got for you today is simply an introduction. Uh, so my cat, title of my message today is, Who is the Holy Spirit? So that's what we're going to look at today. He's also known as the Counselor in some passage. In another passage, he was known as the Comfort. So those three things can describe the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, Counselor, or Comforter. In Scripture, when you read those, that's, they're all talking about the same person. And who is that person? But it's God himself. Amen. We have the big mystery in the world, especially to convert Jew, Jew, through Jews through their faith in Judaism, is the description of three gods versus one God. But we know that three gods are one God. So I, to try to understand it in my brain, uh, I have to think of God as the body, Jesus is his right hand, Holy Spirit's his left hand. And an example in Genesis, you, I just picture uh, that, you know, in the beginning God created the earth. Well, it's very clear in scripture that Jesus is the one creating it. So he's down here making the earth. The Holy Spirit in chapter 2 is hovering over the water. So here God is with his left hand over here working and his right hand working all at the same time. So the study for us today is what is God's left hand doing? Uh, and all the things that it does do. So if you would open your passage to Matthew chapter 12. So I got a horrendous number of passages that we're going to look at today. Uh, so let us do that. And in Matthew 12, chapter verse 31, we can see that the Holy Spirit can be blasphemed against. And I picked up my wrong message this morning. Because <laughs> they went through and made them chronological as we go through the Bible, but this one is not. So we're gonna add, we're gonna end up jumping all over the place here today. Uh, Matthew 31 it says, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven, man, but the blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven, man. Anyone who denies Christ is the only way to God is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So this passage, and I'm sure you've all heard about the unforgivable sin that mankind can commit. This is, this is the sin that he's talking about. When you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, meaning that you do not believe in him, and you do not accept Christ as your Savior. That is what blasphemy is. So, every person who goes through, even those who believe in Jesus, but believe there's other ways to, to get to God, I believe are blasphemy in the Holy Spirit. So, the other thing that he does is he teaches in 1 John, First John chapter two, verse twenty-seven. It says, "As for you, the anointing you received—in other words, the anointing being the receiving of the Holy Spirit, 
you receive from him being God received in you. And you do not need anyone to teach you, but as his anointing teaches you all about teaches you about all things. Kind of an interesting passage here. Uh, if the Holy Spirit teaches everyone about all things, why do we need preachers? All we need to do is get on our knees and pray and he'll give us the answer to all, all of our questions. Well, there's obviously more to the intent and meaning of that passage because we have thousands of years of very smart members of the Christian faith who study the word and they still can't agree on things. So, and it's, an, it's interesting that I had a client who was telling me one time that he did not need to go to church, that all he needed is read his Bible and the Spirit would, based on this passage, the Spirit would tell him the answer and the meaning of all scripture. And we did have several conversations, and we weren't on the same page. So, <laughs> so anyway, we do need we do need clarification from time to time, and don't didn't take the time to dig in to see what was the real intent of, of that term of the teaching. But uh, it does show us that he does teach us. Uh, thirdly, he comforts. In John four, chapter 14, uh, John chapter 14, verse 16, it says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter or counselor or helper to be with you forever. So there, there we know there's one of the passages that we see where we are promised to receive the uh, Holy Spirit. In John chapter 14, verse 26, we see that Oh, let me see here. What? John 14, 26. But the, but the Counselor of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send to in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. This is a very good uh, thing for a person to rely upon when you're trying to witness for somebody or having theological discussions with friends or whoever is take a moment ask the holy spirit to recall to you the passage that you are trying to remember uh, and i always like to use jesus as an example of knowing what the scripture says but having a, not a clue where it came from because as you remember, all Jesus said was, it is written. He didn't tell Satan where it was written at. So I kind of rely on that. That's my excuse to not remember. <laughs> so anyway. So he reminds us of the scriptures, of the things that we need to know at the point in time. What we have to do is have the trust that he will do that and to rely upon him for that. So uh, I guess I was incorrect. I did get him right. So John 15, 26, which is chapter over. Uh, John 15, 26 says that the Holy Spirit testifies. It says, when the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. It's interesting when I was studying this thing and reading that scripture, the thing that popped into my mind was, if you remember, ah, some time ago, 
the other day for an old guy is up to nine months. Uh, <laughs> Glenn was asking us to come up with the, the, as many scriptures as he could possibly come up with to, that talks about the, whole, the Trinity. It's the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so I, I see and uh, recognize in this passage that that does that. When the counselor will come, who, who I will send you, I as God, will send from the Father, Jesus is talking here, and the Spirit. So we're, this passage talks about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Very interesting, just as a side note on that. Okay, the Holy Spirit convicts in John 16, 8. It says, when he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regards to sin and righteousness and judgment. That's a broad statement. He's going to convince the world. Uh, so that tells me that he's talking to anybody and everybody who was ever born. He's leaning on it, and he does that uh, through their conscience. <coughs> as it is, is written that <coughs> mankind has no excuse not to know that there is God. All you have to do is look at his creation. Uh, and if you look at all, of, at least the ones that I've ever seen or heard of, of cultures, whether it be the Aztecs or the Native American Indians or, or Arabs or Chinese or whatever people group around the world you, you can talk about, excuse me, they all have some form of religion and some form of worship of some form of deity. Uh, so that mankind knows and I believe the Holy Spirit <clears throat> works in all people to be convicted of guilt, uh, of righteousness, and judgment, as it says here. So then look at the John 16, 13. He, the, the Holy Spirit reveals truth. It says, but when, but when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, <coughs> He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. So that tells me that he's revealing what God is telling him to tell us. It's, it's one of the ways that God speaks to us is through the Holy Spirit. And so it tells us that he will guide us into all truth. So if you listen to what he's telling you, he will give you the truth. Uh, and it's so hard, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, it is so hard to tell the difference between when the Holy Spirit is speaking to you or when your brain is talking to yourself. Uh, that's one of the hardest things that, that at least I could have ever have figured out. And I don't think that, I think most people have that same problem. Was it me coming up with this idea and that, you know, that we should do this and that and the other? Or is it the Holy Spirit leading you to, to come up with that thought? Uh, it's difficult to tell. Uh, he can be resisted in Acts 7.51. This is Paul, and they're on a missionary journey in Asia, known today as Turkey, uh, and he's going from Ephesus and Laodicea, you know, several debris, different towns around there. And their ministry, they're taking off, and they want to, they want to go north to to 
to continue his ministry. And it says in Acts 7, verse 51. Uh, no. Whoa. Yeah. It says, I've got the wrong one there. Sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm right. He can be resisted. That's why I lost my place there. Uh, the resisting is... We'll get to Paul and his missionary mission in a little bit. It says, You stiff necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, meaning listening for, to God, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Today we, we can resist the Holy Spirit by rejecting what ha He has revealed, by ignoring what He has said and by being disobedient to his instructions. It's interesting, he's talking to the Jews there, these stiff-necked people. Uh, and a, the, the real <coughs> picture of that is the, the Israelites <coughs> and the religious leaders of the day rejecting Jesus Christ when he was here on earth. So it seems to be, to me, that it would be much harder for them not to resist when it's, Jesus is gone to, back to heaven and all that we have is the Holy Spirit. Uh, but he does, the Holy Spirit does work on them. Uh, we see uh, thousands and thousands and thousands in the Middle East, the Arabs, uh, coming to know Christ. And it's, it's happening today that there are many, many. You always hear about the bad things that are going on in the news media, but there is a great revival in the Arab nations that uh, people are seeing and realizing that Muhammad is not a good God. He's a violent God. He doesn't do anything for the people. So they're turning to Jesus Christ as their saviors. Uh, there's also reports that Christ himself is showing himself individually to him, people, that they are seeing him, uh, which uh, he does do that. They talk about, in American church, we've come so, I'm going to call complacent uh, and comfortable in our religion, that we don't realize that, that God is the same as he was yesterday as he is same today, that he is still doing miracles, he's still showing himself through miracles, and uh, he's still doing his thing. So it's a sad fact that he, the Holy Spirit can be resisted. In Acts we see that he strengthens and encourages. Uh, Acts chapter 9, verse 31. It says, then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. So that shows that this church was doing the right thing. It was staying on the path, walking with Christ, and listening for the Holy Spirit, and uh, and leading them, and they were you know, doing the right thing in life, and it, they had a time of peace, and they, the Holy Spirit strengthened and encouraged them. So that would be something that we should be striving for, is that our little congregation should be seeking the Holy Spirit for guidance, uh, and being with us each day and helping us to live our lives. Uh, so, but I guess you, we, you know, I should mention that, like any conversation, the Holy Spirit is not always talking and you're talking back or listening. Uh, just like any conversation, uh, there are times of silence. People don't, don't continually talk with each other on a constant basis. Uh, of course, I could get myself in trouble in parentheses and say it unless you're a woman. But I won't say that. Uh, <laughs> but so, uh, 
So he's not always knocking on the door and talking to us. It's just some, but we need to be aware that he does talk to us when we may not even expect it. We may not be in an you know, atmosphere of, of like sitting in church. We may be in a business meeting at work, or we may have an important time where we're witnessing to someone or should be witnessing to someone. And then it's the times that you, you would expect the Holy Spirit to speak to you. So, uh, in Acts ch chapter 16, Uh, it says in there that he forbids in Acts 16 6 it says Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of okay this is this is the passage where Paul was in in uh, Asia and he's on his missionary trip because he's because he, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of where, Phrygia, Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit for preaching the word in the province of, of Asia. I'm not sure exactly where they're, you know, I didn't look that term up because I thought Asia was Turkey. So uh, I'm not sure exactly, because I thought they were headed for Macedonia and that that's where they were being prohibited from going to. But anyway, for the purposes of this morning, the fact is that the Holy Spirit does sometimes forbid you from doing what you want to do. Now, for him to be able to do that, you need to be listening for him. Because if you're ignoring him, there's, no, there's nothing he can do to forbid you from doing something or telling you not to do this. So again, the issue is, are you listening for his voice? Uh, he lives in us. Turn to Romans 8, 11. Romans. So now you're going to have to back up because it's Romans chapter 8, verse 11. says in there, and if the spirit of whom who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead also will also give you life to your mortal bodies through the Holy Spirit who lives in you. So when do we receive the Holy Spirit who is living in us? That is when we accept Christ as our Savior. Scripture makes that very clear. That we are involved by the Spirit at the point of, of uh, salvation, I guess. I could put that. So, He's in you. It's good to be aware that He's in you. It's kind of like at Passover time when we uh, uh, do the Passover. Why well, I, I wear a kippah on my head like the, like the Jews do. And the, one of the purposes of a kippah is to remind you that you are a religious person. So we need to be always to be aware that the Spirit is in us. And if we did that, there would be probably a few things that we wouldn't do in life when we get into certain circumstances. Uh, the Spirit leads. Romans, again, in chapter 8, verse 13 and 14. For if you live according to a sinful nature, you will die. But if you, but if by the Spirit uh, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So... The key here is allowing us to be led by the Spirit. We can, we can, we can do that 
if we allow him to work in our lives. Uh, very difficult for mankind to do it, even probably more difficult for the guys to do it, because we have a tendency to be a little more willful. Uh, the Holy Spirit bears witness in 8 verse 16. It says there, the Spirit himself testifies or witnesses, depending on what version of the Bible you have, with our spirit that we are God's children. So he helps us realize that we belong to God. Uh, and unfortunately, sometimes we have a tendency to forget that. And we wander off into our own ways of life and rebellion and... Uh, our own selfishness. So in Romans 8.26, a few verses down, it says, He helps and intercedes for us. Uh, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. So anybody ever experienced that? The Holy Spirit praying for you? Or were you aware of that? That that was taking place? Uh, I've several, a couple of times have ex known that was taking place just at the point of time when you're waking up from the time you're asleep to the time you're totally awake. There's that little vague time there. A couple of times I have realized that the Spirit was spraying. Uh, and that's, uh, it's, it's just such a flash, you don't really know what he's talking about. But you do realize that he is, in fact, interceding for you. Uh, kind of a neat experience. Another thing that I've found is when I wake up, I'm so amazed that I'm singing. <clears throat> Uh, they play music up here all the time, and I absolutely can never remember what the lyrics are of any particular song we're uh, singing at the time. That's why we have this big thing on the screen, to help me and maybe all you. <laughs> but there I am in my sleep singing the words to the song. So I guess I know the words, I just can't recall them. I don't know. <laughs> kind of a strange deal. Uh, but it's an interesting experience to, to have that. Okay, Romans chapter 15, uh, verse 16. It says here, he sanctifies. In uh, chapter 15, verse 16, to be a minister of Jesus Christ to the uh, Gentiles with the priestly duties of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So what they're talking about there is the fact that Gentiles can come to know Christ. The Jews thought they had to exclusive opportunity or access to God and they were uh, as you read in the in the scriptures that they were really quite shocked when they came to find that they actually Gentiles had the same right as, as they did for access to God but so what does sanctify means it means to be made holy or to be made clean that's simply all it means uh, and of course you have to be holy and you have to be clean before you can be declared righteous, which means right with God. So once you become clean, then you can have access to, to, to God himself. He's next, he knows things of God. Uh, interesting concept. The Holy Spirit is God. So wouldn't you expect that he would know the things of God? But you know, the scripture goes through here in uh, turn to 1 Corinthians. 
1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 11. For who among among for who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Holy Spirit. Or the Spirit of God. Uh, so, like I said earlier. When, this, when the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, it is the same thing as God speaking to you. So, uh, brings up an interesting question. When God spoke to Abram and told him to pick up and go to the land that he was showing, who was speaking there? God, Jesus, or the Holy Spirit? Uh, I think you can probably look in the scriptures and look in the uh, Hebrew and it'll tell you which one it was. And in such case, each time that happens, I believe you can look and see who is speaking at that point in time. Uh, but it takes some study and digging to find out. Uh, then in 1 Corinthians, turn to chapter 12. So it says that he baptized. For well, we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now I looked that up and did a little study on that, and it doesn't mean that he was had uh, Jim Beam to drink. Because um, as we know, alcohol is sometimes called spirits. This is the Spirit of God that he's talking about. Uh, don't know how you go about drinking him, but apparently you can. Uh, and it's one of those things, kind of a highlight that I'll share with you here, is each one of these that we're looking at, each one of them can be a Sunday message unto itself. There's so much detail in all of this stuff. So, like I said, this is just an introduction to who the Holy Spirit is. So the next one, 1 Thessalonians. <laughs> Just before Timothy, if you're looking. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9 states that the Holy Spirit can be grieved or can be quenched. It says, do not quench the Spirit. They're doing things that are wrong. Uh, so, so when you, that's simple what the passage said, do not quench the Spirit. So what does that mean? Uh, in doing my research, it is pretty much doing things that are wrong, such as lying, stealing, being angry, cursing, unforgiving others, sexual immorality, uh, just to name a few of the sins that we live in and, uh, in our everyday lives. So when we do those things, we are quenching the Holy Spirit. You know, I kind of picture it that if you're doing something, say like a person who drinks excessive alcohol, uh, to me, he, he grieves the Holy Spirit. He doesn't, because he's in us, he doesn't want to have anything to do with that, so he goes and hides under our big toenail. And he hides there until this whole thing is over and we return <laughs> back to, to where he should be. That's, that's, to me, that's grieving the Holy Spirit, because he really doesn't want you to be doing that. Um, Where's that one? What's that? Where's that verse? First Thessalonians. Okay. Five nineteen. Isn't it? Nineteen. Oh, okay. I said nine. It's nineteen. It's five. Okay. Sorry about that. 
Okay, turning to uh, Ephesians. He seals us. Ephesians 4, verse 30. And it says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit, which we've already talked about, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So we have been sealed. The day of redemption, is, I believe, is uh, the day that we are taken up in the rapture. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, when you, when you look at, up the term sealed, it indicates something that you have is worth, uh, worth, is worth meant much, that is something that is very important, that it has something of authority over uh, of whatever you're doing. Uh, an example of that is the king sends a message to somebody, and he prepares it, he puts wax on it, and he seals it with his seal so that no one else can look at it, meaning that this document is very important. And so that, when God looks at us, we have a seal on us showing that we are very important. Then look at Ephesians 5, chapter, or verse 18. It says, do, do not drink, uh, let me see, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So there is one of the uh, issues that the Christian church, at least in America, has made a real big issue over, is the, over the filling of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Some say you're filled with the Holy Spirit when you receive Christ, and you receive the Holy Spirit. There are others who say you receive the Holy Spirit, but proof that you are filled with the Holy Spirit is the practice of speaking in tongues. Uh, hence the, the charismatic, I call it charismatic, there's three or four different ones that they're or on that, under that umbrella, I guess. Um, I don't particularly believe in that stance or take, because one thing that I think is a good argument for, or against, is if some people are spirit-filled and speak in tongues, and the others who don't speak in tongues or practice this gift of speaking in tongues, that means there are the other people. So we have the haves and the have-nots. I don't think God set up us as that type of, of situation. We're all Christians. We're all, we're all created under God, and we all have the Holy Spirit. So I don't, I don't believe, and, and, and my argument is, you know, if you really prove that you're filled with the Holy Spirit, then you would tithe exceedingly, you know? Because that happens to be my spiritual gift. I don't speak in tongues. So to prove that I have the Holy Spirit, I give, uh, give freely. So anyway, that's the thing that divides the church. It's unfortunate that it does. Uh, but it, you know, that's just the man. We have the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Uh, so we all just a part of mankind is we have all these different denominations who all think a little differently, and that's the way God made us. So, but a few of the things to look for to know whether you're filled with the Spirit, because we all are from time to time. We're not filled all the time, uh, but from time to time we do become filled by the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that you can look for is pressure. Uh, uh, the Holy Spirit, when you're filled with him, is he, he is in all aspects of your physical being and kind of picture of pressure inside of you. Kind of like a sailboat. A little wind pushes against the sail and it's pushed along as it travels with the wind pushing it. That's the way I, you can picture the Holy Spirit is applying pressure inside of you to get you to go and do the things you should be doing. Uh, that's what's one aspect. Another aspect is uh, 
permeation. That's a, quite a word. And that means it's an example of that is I'm into baking now. There's something to do in my spare time. So you mix up the batter, and then it says mix in an egg. So you drop an egg in there, and you have the batter, and your egg is laying in your pan. It's two separate things. But you turn the mixer on, and you mix it all up and blend that egg into the batter. The batter is now permeated with the egg. You can't tell, you can't separate uh, the two apart. So likewise, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, your whole body is filled and you can't tell anywhere within you or your lifestyle uh, the difference, you're, or you can tell the difference, that you have the Holy Spirit in you and you're filled with it. And, and again, uh, you, are, you are totally in tune with God. You're totally uh, doing what he wants you to be doing. Uh, and the other thing, idea of being filled by the Holy Spirit is domination. The, the Holy Spirit dominating in your life. It says, what is in control of you at a given moment? Filled with anger, uh, dominates your thoughts and actions. Filled with fear, dominates your uh, approach to life. And being filled with the Holy Spirit dominates your life and how you walk with God. So uh, that's one of the attributes of the Holy Spirit is being filled. And then listening to and for the Holy Spirit. Turn to John 16, 10. No, John 10, 16, sorry. That would have been gotcha for you, wouldn't it? It says, I have other sheep that are, are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice, and there they shall be one flock and one shepherd. So the gist of that passage there is he's talking about the sheep, uh, the shepherd and the flock, and the sheep know the voice of the shepherd, and they listen to him. So as we are, we are part of God's flock. We know his voice. We should listen to him. Uh, so how do you go about doing that? That is the difficult thing all people have in listening for the Holy Spirit. And as I mentioned before, uh, knowing whether you see something happening or you see something you want to do or something of that nature and you don't sure you should go do that or you don't do that, and you look back and say, hmm, that was the Holy Spirit, I should have been doing that. And the things that, the thing that convinced me years ago, we were sitting, Jeannie and I were sitting in a cafe in, in uh, Missoula, and there was a young, a group of young people sitting at the table behind me. And this one gal says, well, Jesus Christ, I don't want to go do this, and blah, blah, and she got, went on with the conversation. And I had a thought in my mind, I should go ask her. She knows who Jesus Christ is. She's talking about him. So who is he? Well, I didn't do that. And I'm telling you that today because I should have done that. That was one of the times the Holy Spirit was leading me to go talk to her and ask her, do you know who he is? You can go to there's a wonderful church on Russell Street. Go there. They'll tell you who he is. But I didn't do that. So, I lost an opportunity to share Christ with someone. Another time, we were down in uh, Ogden, Utah, and we were sitting there again in the restaurant. We do that a lot when we travel, eat. <laughs> so I was sitting there, 
And these two young missionaries come in, the Mormon missionaries come in. They get up there, and the Lord says, you need to go talk to those two. And I go, no, no, no. But this time, I said, okay, I'll do that. So I walked up to them, probably scared the poor kids to death, and asked them, you know, are you more, more than missionaries? And he says, yeah. I says, those are the gallows. I didn't want to talk about it. And I says, well, you know, you do realize that you're uh, serving a false god. Oh, what? They got <laughs> So I said, you know, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He died for your sins, and he raised on the third days. And that's all you need. You don't need works to get to heaven. And so we talked a little bit, and then finally the kid says, well, is it all right if we agree to disagree? And, oh, sure, that's fine. So anyway, I don't know what the purpose of that was, what he had for me to go talk to those kids, but I did it. So when you have them inklings, if it's something to further the righteousness or further the kingdom of God, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. And just always keep that in mind. Does this further the kingdom of God, the, the thoughts that I'm having in my head? So with that, our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We just thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit. We just thank you for uh, your leading in our lives and helping us to walk in righteousness, Lord. And we just praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.